Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to just feast upon your word in the way that we're going about it here. With all of the trouble and all of the turmoil that's going on in the world, I just pray that we would all just set our affections on things above, not on things below. We are well aware of our limitations. I just ask that you would take and seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In our last video, the beginning video of John, we looked at how that Jesus Christ is eternal. He's God of very God, and because He is eternal, then He must be God. He has to be God. I think that we uh, touched on the fact of, of how John 1, uh, the similarity between John 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, and uh, I believe I pointed out how that uh, what we can see in this is, is how that creation itself uh, in the beginning uh, has a great similarity to the opening of the Gospel of John. We're about to get into something that uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit is building up or leading up into something that is, uh, well, something that's that's of the utmost importance, if, if, if not the most important single subject that any of us as Christians could possibly talk about, and that's our new birth. And so the Holy Spirit, I believe, is running up to that in what we're presently looking at right now. We know that, uh, or we've, we ought to be able to see that, that creation in itself, in Genesis, it shadows our new birth. In, in, a, in a very real sense, where we, that we read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Well, so were we before being made a new creation. Uh, the word void there in the original text means empty. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. That darkness representing the absence of light in our lives uh, the darkness of sin. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the Lord uh, himself uh, re reacted in, in, in our lives first. And th the word moved there as the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The word means brooded. Uh, brooded as to think deeply about something that makes you unhappy. We were lost sheep that he found. We were his. He came into the world to save his people from their sins. He's, he's done that. He's doing that. But we were his. If you, had, if you, you parents out there, if you lost a child, I think that you would brood about it. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. There had to be light. God spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke our new creation into existence, and he did so through his word. Same reality. We were brought forth as new creations by God's word, Christ, who is light. And God saw that light, that it was good. God is fully pleased with us in his beloved Son fully accepted in the beloved. And God divided the light from the darkness. And we know that light has no fellowship with darkness. It's, it's, it is a very remarkable comparison or similarity there. And uh, 
we're not concerned about uh, who wrote this this book of John. Uh, there's been some debate as to whether or not John actually wrote it. What we do know is that the Holy Spirit wrote both Genesis and John, and I find it remarkable that we see that similarity given the fact that, well, I, I suppose it would be more remarkable if man wrote it and, you, and we saw that similarity, but the fact of the matter is that the Holy Spirit brought forth this reality, this, this shadow or foreshadow or or pattern, if you will, or or however you want to look at that. But I find that fantastic. I find that remarkable. So we're going to continue on through this, and I want to lay out a few points here uh, to start. Uh, uh, just a few notes up front. One is uh, my limitations that I'm concerned about. I'm, I'm deeply concerned that I have the oratory skills or the intellectual skills to, to take and actually bring out of the text what I believe is there. And it's your job to take and, and study these things for yourselves. Uh, don't believe anything just because I believe it. I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything. And to, to look for yourselves to see if these things be so. Always examine what I say, what I believe, what I preach, what I teach. Don't take anything for face granted, for fa at face value, or don't take anything for granted. So we're going to go through this. I've made some notes here uh, on on the original text. It's I, I may I don't mean to get I, I don't want to take away from the simplicity of Christ and the wonder and the beauty of Christ as we see. In, him in the text here but there are a few things that, that uh, some of you that out there that those of you who actually thrive on the uh, uh, more complex grammatical uh, structure uh, of this you might you might really enjoy uh, looking at this these are just some of the things that I've seen so in him is life we know that in Christ is life. I want to say that right up front. I think we could all agree that in Him is life. Present tense, is, is, I, S, is. Okay, take a note of that, at least a mental note of that as I begin uh, going through this. Verse 4, in Him was life. Well, now we have the word was. It's an imperfect folks imperfect tense and the life was that's another imperfect the light of men now I believe this to be a reference to the fall because it's leading up to the Holy Spirit is leading us up building us up to building this and leading us up to the, the new birth which we will see in chapter 3 And the words in that sentence, construction, folks, are interchangeable. These are interchangeable. Grammatically, technically, in the Greek, you could say the light was the life of men and the, the life was the light of men. They are absolutely, definitely interchangeable because the Greek definite article is there. In both cases, in the predicate, it's, it's known as the Granville Sharp Rule in Greek grammar. You know, like, uh, like, like John went home, you could say John went home, or you could say, or home John went. So the, here's the question, folks. Why does it not say, in him was life? You know, the, the mental note that I asked you to, to, to write down or at least take a mental note of. Why does it not say that? We have to ask ourselves. We have to stop here and we have to say, why does it not say in him was life? Because that is theologically true. Why is this an imperfect? We can see why it's imperfect in the verse because we're going back before creation we have it in the most simplest 
statement, as dogmatic as the sovereign God can be, that Jesus Christ is eternal, and if he's eternal, he's God, but now in verse 4, in him was life. No, in him is life. We know that, and so, you know, articles are written, you know, why is it the imperfect, and it's astounding how many, how many solutions have been proposed. You know, so I guess that gives me the right to propose one of my own. Folks, I, I have been warned my whole life, you know, Steve, don't wander from the well-known path. You know, people have told me, if, if you propose anything that hasn't been proposed before, then it's, it's wrong. I, I looked at at least 10 ideas proposed over the, over, the, over the past 400 years, but what about all of the years before that? Now, I'm not saying that to lead up to my suggesting something that's not in the literature. I'm not. I'm just going about it a bit different. I'm going to suggest to you that it's imperfect because of the fall. Now, now for those of you that don't know what the imperfect is, I remind you the imperfect tense in the Greek, the, the New Testament Greek, indicates an action in the past that was ongoing or used to take place over a period of time. Think of it sort of as a bit of video of an action from the past. I believe the Holy Spirit is building up to chapter 3, the profound spiritual truth that it is absolutely necessary because of our total depravity that there be a second birth. Birth. And, and I want you to think, folks, how that, that total depravity and birth, new birth, born again, being born again by the will of God, total depravity and birth are married to one another. They are in perfect harmony with one another. If, if it were not for the fact, let, I, let me see if I can say this correctly. If we were not totally depraved, if we were not totally depraved, there would be no need for a new birth. Now, many students of, 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 of Scripture, they, you know, who study the Old Testament and the Gospels, they fail to see the significance of the fact that, that all throughout the Word of God, there seems to be clearly, without a doubt, a preference that comes to us, not simply stated in dogmatic fact, but, but there in type, there's a preference for the second birth. For example, there's Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, who was born first? Esau and Jacob, Ephraim and Manasseh. Who was born first, folks? And there's clearly a preference for the younger. The second birth. That even bothered Joseph. You know, he's like, hey, wait, you know, hold on, Dad. You, uh, you put your right hand on the younger kid. You know, Jacob can't see. We read in, in Genesis chapter 48, Jacob was half blind because of his age and he could, he could barely see. So Joseph brought the boys close to him and Jacob kissed and, and, and embraced them. Joseph wants the kids blessed. He pushes Manasseh toward Jacob's right hand and Ephraim toward Jacob's left hand because Manasseh is firstborn and gets the blessing of the firstborn. And this old blind man crosses his hands and puts his right hand on Ephraim's head. He puts his left hand on Manasseh's head and Joseph's like, you know, dad, you made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. There was a very deliberate design choice for the younger. And then there's the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, 12, uh, 
And, you know, so which one asked for his inheritance? The younger. Typif typifying. Second birth. And the, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Second birth. Fantastic. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. We touched on the word there for comprehend, the word katalambano, to, to comprehend, to lay hold upon. And the translation, as always, the translation depends upon the context. You know, uh, I had a ball last night. You, so, you know, uh, what, how, are you to, how, how are you to understand it? You don't know what I mean unless you look at the context. If that's the only sentence that you have, I had a ball last night, then you have no idea what it means. You know, I, I, can, I can draw a picture. I can draw uh, a breath. I can draw water from a well. I can draw my pistol. I can draw... You know, I think you understand what I'm saying. Speed can be, a, you know, a pattern that one gets high on or it can refer to velocity. That's what I'm saying. If you have a newer translation, the darkness was not able to overcome the light. If you have an older translation, the darkness did not understand the light, and that's the right one. The Holy Spirit is introducing us to total depravity. The, the theology of modern evangelism, that, that which I've, I've probably at least a thousand times referred to as modern Christianity, the, the legal system, the world religious system based on human merit, is inconsistent when it comes to that term. If unregenerate man can do one thing, folks, to please God, then he's not totally depraved. I believe it started with life. In Genesis, it all started with let there be light. In our lives as Christians, it all started with God infusing life in us first, where that we were then able, to, we bypassed that whole reality of the flesh profiting nothing, the flesh not being able to produce anything, to do anything good. We were made alive, and everything else followed. But what modern Christianity has done is put the cart before the horse and made it, made it all out to be a, 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 a situation in, in which... Well, everything hinges on or is dependent upon an unregenerate man doing something so that he, he can then be regenerated. Folks, that is not what our text says. That's not what this book teaches. I know it's been hard for some of you to understand that you live in an age of, that we are living, presently living in an age of apostasy greater than, than, than what most people could possibly imagine, but that it's true. Last verse of Luke 15, prodigal son, verse 32. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. This, my son, was dead and is alive again. How do you say something is dead if, if, if it wasn't first alive, if it never lived? Life must precede death. If it never had life, folks, then it's grammatically foolish to say that it was dead. And so we had a death in Adam. That death was so total, so complete, it was not able to comprehend the light. Because the mind of the flesh is hostility toward God. It is not subject to the law of God. 
for not even can it be. Romans 8, 7. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 8. Oh, so many steps, you know, in the wrong, the ladder to, you know, to climb, to become a child of God, folks, is unbiblical. And, you know, you didn't find Christ. Christ found you. Christianity today has turned that around as well. Jumping ahead, I know, but I want, to, I want you to look at John 3.20. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Now, think about what that verse is saying, folks. Modern evangelism says that everyone who does evil could, if they want to, love the light. In fact, they should love the light and that you shouldn't fear the light exposing your deeds. Therefore, you, you need to acknowledge your sin, which is just the opposite of fearing your deeds be exposed. But that is not what the verse says. That's not what that verse says. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Folks, don't just breeze over these verses. Don't take them so lightly. L listen to what God is saying. This is God who has done this in our lives. The text doesn't say, for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who, has, uh, who will sh shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ if uh, the, you, you know, we as darkness comprehend the light. It doesn't say that. Isaiah 42, 16, I will lead the blind by a way they did not know. I will guide them on unfamiliar paths. I will turn darkness into light before them. I will turn, I will turn darkness into light before them. And, and, and folks, listen to me. I think we should all be able to agree on the fact that when God says, let there be light, there's light. In rough places, into level ground, these things I will do for them, and I will not forsake them. It's clear that the text is leading up to chapter 3. You must be born again, which is, well, which is the must of necessity. I've talked about that. The must of necessity, not the must of obligation. Jesus Jesus, folks, when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, Jesus was not telling Nicodemus he had to do anything. He was simply stating a fact. You, you must be born again. It's true. I can walk up to you, to, to any, anyone who doesn't know the Lord, I can walk up, right up to their face and say, I have every right to say, you must be born again. It's because that's, it's a, that's a fact. They, they must be born again. Without, me, without it being that I, I, I'm not telling them to do anything. I'm not saying that they need to born themselves again by telling them that they must be born again. Jesus didn't say to Nicodemus, to Nicodemus that he had to do something to be born again. And we will see long before we get to that verse in chapter 3, verse 7, long before we ever even get to it, we're about to see which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, verse 13. The Holy Spirit expects us to know verse 13 before we get to chapter 3. The idea that unregenerate, unrighteous man decides that he's going to heaven and decides when he's going to heaven 
and in some cases it can be over the telephone. And that that decision somehow pleases God, folks, is not only not biblical. It it flies in it's it, it is contrary to everything that the Bible says about this subject. No angel in heaven ever ever rejoiced over an unregenerate man doing something to please God because no man ever did. There is none righteous, no, not one. There was life in Adam. And there was the fall resulting in death. And what followed that fall was absolute, absolute darkness, spiritual darkness. A second birth, is then necessary. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that is the word, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We had life in Adam. We had death when Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, you sinned. When Adam sinned, I sinned. When Adam died, we died. Now we must be born again. Second birth. Born of the Spirit. Just as the younger son blessings the second born typify. When we get... Uh, to the ninth verse, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Light, folks, equals life. Life equals light. Interchangeable terms. In John 6, 33, he's the one that gives life to who? The world. The world. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. How did he do that? How did he do that? I thought he, but Steve, I thought he only gave life to those whom he chose in him. Uh, only his elect, only his sheep. Are you saying, how, how can the text say that he, gave, he, gave, he gives life unto the world? He giveth life unto the world. How did he do that? By removing Adam's transgression, folks. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the elect. No. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. We have a, a huge theological problem if there's one sin Christ didn't pay for. Everybody started on the same basis. Every one of God's sheep, you and I, if you're, if you're one of God's elect, every one of God's sheep started out alive. Though they died in Adam, though we died in Adam, we were made alive in Christ. How? When Christ died. The, uni the, the atonement, folks, it was universal. This is why for you, for you Calvinists out there, Who've, who've rightly labeled me pretty much a Calvinist. You need to understand that in the TULIP acronym, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, the reason it's limited is, be, is not, it, it's not saying that there was not a universal atonement in which Christ removed Adam's transgressions from all men where he gave life unto the world. What it's saying is, by that limited at at atonement, is, is that Christ died in our place. Okay? Listen. I've tried to explain this in past videos. It's, a, it's, it's tough. It really is. It confuses a lot of people. 
It's not, it's not, but it's not complicated, folks. We had to start out alive in Adam. Nothing dies unless it's first alive. So we were alive in Adam. We died in Adam. We were made alive in Christ. Universal atonement. Okay? Made alive. That's everyone. Elect, non-elect, everyone born into the world. And by the way, this is why children, all children, go to heaven. Listen to me. So you started with Adam's condemnation removed in Christ. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as by the offense of the one Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteous, righteousness of one, Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of the one shall many be made righteous. Romans 7, 9, and this is key here, folks. Listen. Romans 7, 9, For I was alive without the law once, says Paul. Well, how was he alive once, without, apart from the law? Because of that universal atonement. Because the, Adam's transgressions were removed in Christ. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, that's the law, sin revived and I died. Therefore, alive, you died in your own sin, own sin, not Adam's. You died in your own sin and had to be born again. Are you getting this? This is what the, our text is saying. This is what this book says. This is what it says, folks. We, no one is going to be able to stand before God and blame Adam for going to hell. Do you, are you hearing me? Because Adam's transgression was removed in Christ. The law came in, though, in their lives. Just as Paul said, there was a time, there's a time in their lives where the commandment comes in, the law comes in, sin revives, and you die. Therefore, you die in your own sin and you have to be born again. It's why all children go to heaven. Because they haven't, the law did not, hasn't come into their lives where that sin revives and they die. Isaiah 53, 6, And speaking of us, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Us all. Not everybody. Us all. He died in our place, resulting in new birth. All of a sudden it changed. Our iniquities, not Adam's. Adam's was laid on Christ so that that condemnation was universally removed. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Our own sins were laid on Christ so that ours is removed, but not every man's. The second birth is for his children. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. 1 Peter 1, 3, we've been begotten again. Listen, we've been begotten again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That means you were begotten once before to that blessed hope. Isn't that two births? Does it make any sense to say that one of those is physical? You know, your physical birth begot you again to a blessed hope. But your first and second spiritual birth did. Water, the Word, and wind, the Spirit. In Jude one twelve. 
these people are not physically dead. They're feasting among them. But they're, they're said to be twice dead. Twice dead. How? Because they died in Adam, and then they died in their own sin. They're twice dead. That's the second death of Revelation. This is why all children will be in heaven, because they never died in their own sin. Paul, I was once alive apart from the law. Adam's sin removed in Christ, universal, all men. But when the commandment came, and it never does for children who physically die, where the law came in, sin became alive, and they died. I don't want to rush through this study, folks. I don't. There's so much here, and there's no reason to, to get in a hurry. I know that there's... Uh, I watch the news. I know what's going on with Iran and other places around the world. I know what's going on in the world. Uh, I'm not interested in the least in being just one more talking head that you can you can listen, turn to the news and listen to. Okay? All right. We have a mission, a purpose, a function here at Blessed Hope Forever. And that is to focus at this particular time more on the content, the message, the hope, the blessed hope, not in the sense of when the rapture might occur, but how we're going to stand before God when it does. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. And, and I, I'm praying for you all constantly and ask for you, uh, your prayers as well. Until next time, thanks for watching.